Good job. Okay. Yeah. So um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining on a Tuesday. And um, we're going to be kicking off the third workshop of the Machine Learning um, for Social Good workshop series. And um, this is our last workshop um, of the series. And then following on from that, we have our amazing hackathon in August that Keisha will talk about more. So my name is Safar Duffy and I'm a leadership fellow at Women Who Code and um, I lead the blockchain and data science track with Naomi. Um, Naomi, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Naomi. I'm the other leadership fellow. <laughs> um, that's about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're super excited to be here today. Um, so this is our awesome team that's behind um, the data science track. Um, these ladies are absolutely amazing to work with and they work really hard um, in leading our community and so a massive appreciation to them. At Women Who Code, um, if you aren't familiar with our mission, um, we are a global non-profit organisation dedicated to inspiring women to excel in technology careers. And um, we envision a world where, where women um, are representative as technical um, executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. And across the world, we have now um, over 230,000 members, um, and we have 70 networks in 20 countries. And we have members in over 97 countries, and we have run over 10,000 events. And we give out daily conference tickets um, and $2 million worth of scholarships. And you can access, um, um, we give access to jobs and resources on our website. And our movement, um, as the world changes, um, we can be a connecting force that creates a sense of belonging while the world is being asked to isolate. And um, please take a look at our code of conduct. We follow a strict code of conduct, which is embedded into the community. And we encourage our members to have an inclusive mindset. And if you feel if something's not right, um, you can fill out an incident form on our website. And um, we just want everyone to be safe uh, in our community. And I'll give you a little bit of information about the track, the technical track communities. So, um, Women Who got a lot of um, requests from women who wanted to deep dive into technologies and the tracks were created last year. And of course, this is a data science track and we host tech talks, workshops, tutorials, um, training live streams, study groups, um, and a lot of other kind of events. Um, join our um, Slack group and introduce yourself and because we, we would love to connect with you. And we post all of our um, events on our Slack as well. And I want to um, thank our amazing sponsors, The Home Depot and Bank of America. And if you want to get involved um, in our community, um, we are always looking for leads, evangelists and volunteers. So if you think this is something you would like, to, you would be interested in, please reach out to Naomi um, or myself, or you can fill out a form on the Women Who Code website. And now um, I'll introduce you to Keisha. So um, Keisha is an AWS um, community hero and an AWS training architect at the Cloud Guru. And I pass it on over to you, Keisha. Stop sharing my screen here. There we go. Okay, hello everyone. Let me share my screen. and present my slides. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my slides. So welcome to our third and final workshop. Today we are going to talk about the inner workings of the training process and learning algorithms. So we had two um, prior workshops. We've recorded both of those. So if you need to watch those to get caught up, they are out there and they are available. And as a reminder, the goal of this workshop series is to prepare you for this mission predictable virtual machine learning hackathon. 
And this is where you create a machine learning model using AWS to battle COVID-19. And if you have not received your $200 in AWS credits, please message me on Slack so that I share that information with you. It will definitely help you as you play around with SageMaker. It's a pretty expensive service and you build out your submission for the hackathon. As a reminder, the winning team receives one year free membership to A Cloud Guru. That's the company that I work for. And we are an online education slash training company. And we have tons of online videos that really teach you about the cloud, help prepare you for your certification exam. And we have courses for all of the major cloud vendors, AWS, GCP, Azure, et cetera. And we also have a lot of what we call cloud adjacent technology courses like Python, um, things on machine learning, et cetera. And you will also receive $5,000 in AWS credits to help you um, continue your learning and building out your hackathon project. Over the last few weeks, we've discussed the machine learning lifecycle. And last week, we looked at obtaining data and preparing that data. Today, we're going to look at training the model, evaluating the model, and then deploying that model. So I've used the term training a lot. What exactly is training? Training is where you take the data, so all of the data that we prepared last week, you take that data and you feed it to a machine learning algorithm. That algorithm then produces what's called the model, and we should be familiar with the model. I've used that term from the beginning. And so the model is just a mathematical representation of the trends and patterns found in data. So you take your data, and last week we uh, prepared our data, and then we wrapped up last week with splitting that data. So we took 70% of that data, and we're going to use that to actually train the model. And then we're going to take 30% of that data, and we're going to use that to evaluate the model that we produce. So the way this works, the model basically has data that already has the answers that we're trying to predict. And so it uses this 30% evaluation subset to test how accurate it is at making a prediction. So what's this learning algorithm? So during training, the learning algorithm is going to make multiple passes over the data. And like I mentioned, it's going to store the trends and patterns found in this model. During training, several passes are made over the data. So that means several models are actually created during this training process. And you can think about it like poor performing models are tossed out. And at the end of the training process, you have this model um, that is well performing. And so this process continues basically for the number of epochs or epochs, if you're in London, <laughs> that you have defined and you set that as a hyperparameter. And we talked about hyperparameters uh, one of the last few weeks. And those are just configuration options to your training job. And so within this learning algorithm, there are actually two components of the learning algorithm. The first is a loss function, and the second is an optimization technique. So the loss function, it's, you can think of it like the penalty. So the penalty that's incurred when the model guesses incorrectly. And then there's this optimization technique that really seeks to minimize loss. So during this training process, all of this feedback from the loss function, from the optimization technique, that feedback is used to produce a better, uh, a better model. And there are several optimization techniques out there. AWS uses what's called stochastic gradient descent, SGD. And like I said, it's, it's an optimization technique. 
And when we talk about learning algorithms, out of the box, SageMaker currently has 17 learning algorithms. I've listed just a few of the more popular ones here. And what AWS has done, they have actually provided optimized versions of these algorithms. And you can access these algorithms in two ways. First, through the AWS Management Console, whenever you create a training job um, through the SageMaker Console. Or you can access these learning algorithms by calling the associated API from your Jupyter Notebook. Um, so for image classification, that's one popular um, learning algorithm that AWS has optimized and it takes an image and it provides a label. They also have k-means and that is a form of clustering and it's a learning algorithm that finds discrete groupings within data. And then there's linear learner. That one can answer binary yes, no questions. It can provide uh, numeric values or class labels. Then they also have object detection and that classifies objects in images. They also have random cut forests, and that is used to detect anomalies in data. And blazing text, that's a text classification, and people use that for sentiment analysis. So if you remember, I believe it was either the first or second workshop where I went through a few examples, and I talked about my public safety model, that actually used AWS's linear learner. Uh, learning algorithm. And I talked to you about the emotion detection that use the image classification. And the last example that I shared with you um, was my movie recommendation engine that used k-means, but not the AWS version of k-means. It used um, the scikit-learn version. So let's talk about some of the scikit uh, learning algorithms, scikit learn learning algorithms that we're going to talk about today. And the three um, that I mentioned to you last week, and I did give you homework to go and read up on these three learning algorithms. So I hope that you did that. And these three, Naive Bayes, Random Forest, and Logistic Regression, these algorithms solve uh, what we call classification problems. So this is where you want to know which class or group an observation belongs to. And this typically includes two classes, like the binary question, the yes, no answer, or the multi-class classification where you're selecting from one of many. And so Naive Bayes, that is a family of algorithms. And so when we think about, I guess, all of the different learning algorithms out there, they all come with pros and cons. And so it's important for you to really understand the pros and cons of these different algorithms and when you would want to choose one over the other. And so, for example, with Naive Bayes, it's good for real-time predictions and when you have really large data sets. Um, it doesn't really work well when you don't have diverse data. So if, if you have missing values, it doesn't perform well. And that was my experience. So the data that we cleaned up last week, I actually created a machine learning model using that data. So I sent that data through the training process using these three learning algorithms. And with Naive Bayes, the accuracy score was only 40%, which is not good at all. And then I looked at Random Forest, and this uses decision trees um, to make a prediction. And it really consists of a large number of individual decision trees. And a pro of this one, it works well for imbalanced data sets and it handles missing data really well. Um, the downside for this learning algorithm is sometimes it's hard to understand why a certain decision was made. It's like a, a black box. And that was pretty much my experience. So when I used um, this learning algorithm to train my model, the accuracy score was at 81%. Um, so it's the exact same data set that I used in the naive phase example and 81% it's it's better than 40% I don't know if it's gr that great but it's it's better than 40 and then logistic regression 
that actually uses an equation to predict uh, an outcome or to make the prediction. So it's good because it's easy to implement. There's not a lot of hyperparameter tuning needed. Um, it doesn't work well on image data. And there are a lot of other algorithms that can outperform this one. And so the model that I created had an 82% accuracy score. So pretty close to the random forest. Okay, so now let's talk about this accuracy score and the confusion matrix. Remember I told you that during the training process, the model, there are multiple models produced and each model is evaluated. And so the way that works, each model has an accuracy score and this thing called a confusion matrix. Um, and I just always joke and say this basically tells me how confused my model is when it's when it's time to generate a prediction. But it's, it's actually how we evaluate model performance. And really it gives us an idea of the number of predictions our model is getting right versus the errors that it's making. And so there are actually four pieces to this confusion matrix. So there are four boxes here. And so the first one is what's called a true positive. So this is where during the evaluation process, the observation or that row or that data set, the answer is positive. And the model actually predicted it to be positive. So it's right, it's a true positive. Then there's this false positive. So this is where the observation is negative but the model predicted it to be positive. So it's, it's a wrong answer. Next, there's what's called the false negative. So the observation is positive, but the model predicted it to be negative. And then lastly, we have true negatives. So this is where the observation is negative and the model predicted it to be negative. So it was right. And this is what it looks like in the Jupyter Notebook. And so if you notice at the very top here, that shows the accuracy score. And then also it shows the confusion matrix. So you see that 55, that is what's considered the true positive. The 52, that's the false negative. The eight, that's the false positive. And the 13, that's the true negative. And I've also at the bottom, you'll see a classification report. And that's also helpful in, in just understanding or evaluating your model. And so this model, this example, this model is only right half of the time, which is not good, <laughs> not good at all. So you have generated this model. It's gone through the training process. It's a well-performing model, you know, a model that is right more than half of the time. And so you have your model and you want to host it. So SageMaker allows you to take this model and really put it in a production environment. So you're productionizing your model and you're making your model available to any system to call through an API endpoint. And so through the SageMaker interface, you can actually take this model artifact and basically put a URL or an API endpoint on top of it. And then you can access that endpoint through Postman or a tool like Postman or really any other application. So think about it like this. Once your model is hosted, any application that can make an HTTP call can get a prediction from your model. And that is where you, that's really where the power comes in um, because now you're actually able to integrate this model into various different systems that need a prediction. And so the process of actually calling out to the model sending in in the data and getting a prediction or a response back is called inference and that is when you use the model really to do what it was made for to provide you a certain prediction so now let's look at the code now this is the same link from last week 
The only difference is the notebook. So whenever you pull the, the code for this week, make sure you pull this workshop three notebook. So now let me jump to the code. Okay. So last week we ended on splitting the data and we did a 70-30 split. So remember 70% for training, 30% for testing. Here, let's look at using the naive Bayes learning algorithm to generate a model. So in these first few cells here, cell 125, 126, 127 and 128, I'm basically just cleaning up the data and printing it out. You know, I like to double check everything. So let me scroll down to get to the next cell. Scroll, scroll, almost there, there we go. So cell 129. So in cell 129, I'm using scikit-learn and I'm creating here the naive Bayes model object. And then I'm calling this fit function and I'm passing in the training data. So this is where you actually start the training process. So now I have this model, NB underscore model. And now I'm going to take that model and I'm just predicting the values using the test set. So that 30% of data and so I'm importing metrics from scikit-learn and then I'm printing out the uh, metrics. So for example, in this case, I'm printing out the accuracy score. And that's what I told you here, the accuracy score is 40%. Not that great. Next, I'm using the random forest that I told you about. It uses a set of decision trees to provide a prediction. So I'm importing that from scikit-learn, the random forest classifier. And just like before, I'm creating that um, model object and then I'm training the model. And then here I am passing in the test data to the model and I'm getting the, the metrics. So here in this case, when testing that model, it has an accuracy score of 81%. So next I'm printing out the confusion matrix that I told you about, and then also this classification report. And so here you see this confusion matrix. So we see the true positives, the false positives, the false negatives, and the true negatives. And then basically following that same pattern for logistic regression. From scikit-learn, I'm importing that and then I'm creating the model object and then I'm calling the fit function to train the model. And then I'm passing in the testing data. And then I'm printing out the accuracy score, the confusion matrix, and the classification report. So there we have, we, we've used three different learning algorithms to create three different models, all with different accuracy scores. And so for the inference, this is where we actually use the model to generate a prediction. I chose the random forest model. And so what I'm doing here, I'm basically saving that random forest model. And when you run this code, you see that the model artifact is saved into your Python notebook. And then you could take that artifact and host it through SageMaker. And I do want to note that, you know, there is a cost 
to just using SageMaker in general. It's a pretty expensive service. That's why it's important for you guys to get the $200 credit. But there is also a cost to actually hosting the model. So if you host your model and you, you leave it available through an API endpoint, I believe the charges, you may see hourly charges. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're developing your final solution for the hackathon. So here I've saved the model and I'm just right now just loading the model again. And now I'm testing it on data, um, not the testing data. So I have this data set here that I've loaded, that's also loaded in GitLab. And so I have this data set, this truncated data set. It does include some data from the original CSV file and then some other um, additional patient records. And so you'll see, um, I'm printing out the data here, just like what we did last week when we were preparing the data and getting it ready for the training process. So here I'm loading the data into this data frame and then I'm printing, printing out the data frame. And it's just a few records, so it's a total of 25 records. And then just like last week, I'm cleaning up the column names, removing spaces, just to make it easier to read and work with and use. And then here I'm just printing it out again to make sure that the column names actually changed. And you notice here, I actually have the result, right? The negative and positive result. That's the value that we're trying to predict. So we don't need it in the data set. And so I'm removing it. And then here I'm double checking, like I like to do to make sure it's gone. <laughs> then I'm printing out the shape, so 25 records. And now here, this is where I'm actually using the model and I'm calling the predict function and I'm passing in the data, oops, I'm passing in the data and then I get the predictions back. So for each of these, I see the predictions. So that is it for that piece. So that was a look at the code that's loaded into the SageMaker, um, that's loaded on GitLab that you guys can pull down and play around with. So what is next? What's the next step? So we've, we've gone through this process of learning or exploring machine learning. Um, we learned about all of the concepts. We learned about data and some of the techniques that we use to prepare the data, process the data, transform the data, encode the data, and really get it ready for the machine learning process. Today, we looked at the different learning algorithms. We understood and explored more about the training process and how that works. We looked at how you, once you have this model, how do you evaluate it. Um, we talked about the accuracy score, the confusion matrix, and then we look at all of the different learning algorithms. So what's next for you? Take everything that you've learned so far and create, enter the hackathon and create a submission for it. And so we've created a form where you can actually go in and sign up for the hackathon. I recommend that you form a team and sign up. Um, we have made some exceptions where if you're not able to form a team and you want to do it alone, you can. So just reach out. And if you need help with finding a team, we can help place you on a team as well. And when we talk about the submissions, so the submissions are due on August 14th and we will have a live judging on August 19th. And the way that will work, each team will have a set amount of time. We'll have to figure out what the time limit will be depending on how many people we have registered for the hackathon. But you will present your project live before a panel of judges and you'll be able to answer any questions that they have. And when I look at the judges that we have, I am just totally amazed and blown away. We have Katie. She is the president at A Cloud Guru, so she will help make the decision. She's really awesome. And then we have four amazing, amazing judges from AWS. 
And so your submission will be judged on the potential impact of your solution and your mastery of AWS tools. And as a reminder, once you enter the hackathon, you form your team and you're actually trying to apply everything that we've uh, learned in the three workshop series, we are there um, to help you. And so we have two Slack channels. If you have not joined, I recommend that you join. The first channel is um, the ML Social Good channel through the Women Who Code Data Science Slack group. And then also, the AWS Machine Learning Community Slack group. We have the event hyphen women who code channel. And we have a team of AWS engineers and solutions architects. They are on standby waiting to answer all of the technical questions that you have related to AWS. If you're in the middle of building your solution and you get stuck and you need help, like I said, we have a team of AWS people just dedicated to this hackathon to help you to make sure that you're, you're successful. So please sign up to both of these channels um, as you're working on, on your project. And then lastly, I just want to wish you all a good luck and to let you know, like, I'm, I'm not going to be a judge. I will be just kind of monitoring the whole process and trying to keep everything on schedule. But I will be there as a mentor to help you. And I just have really big expectations <laughs> of everyone participating in the hackathon. And so I really hope it's my hope and I really expect that you all through this experience that your knowledge and your expertise in machine learning will surpass my knowledge and, and everything that I know. And you know, that's the whole reason why I mentor people to really share like my lessons learned, what I've learned, the mistakes that I've made so that you don't make those same mistakes and so that you have a head start. And so really, I expect all of you to pick up where I left off and just carry the torch forward. So I'm just super happy to be a part of this. And I just really cannot wait to see the machine learning models that you all come up with. So good luck. So let Thanks. me stop sharing. And that's it. Yeah, and then I'll start sharing. Thank you so much. I think everyone's really excited to get going and working on everything for the hackathon. And all of the knowledge and expertise you've shared so far has been really helpful. I've seen a lot of people digging into the, the problems and the cases. So we just have a couple of questions. Um, we'll just open this up here. Uh, just see. So you can see uh, we are at the Q&A right now. Um, going back to some of the yeah. things you were working on earlier today, um, there's a question, what would, what would be considered an acceptable and a good accuracy core for NB? Whenever I develop machine learning models, I always feel good <laughs> if the score is at least 90% or higher. And that's just my, my personal opinion. Um, I've had models that have reached like 96, 97% accuracy score. And for me, that that's really good. So I would say at least a 90% or higher. Anything below that, I just would not feel comfortable uh, releasing that to a production environment and having someone actually use it and, and make a serious decision based on that prediction or outcome? It's a great question. That's a really good answer as well. Um, someone else is, just has a, a more general question asking if you can talk a bit about interpreting findings. So when you say interpreting findings, can you expand on that? Um, that was a question from Cynthia. Um, if you want to just add a little bit to the Q&A there. So you have the accuracy score 
you have the confusion matrix that talks through like the true positives, the false positives, and then you have that classification report. So those are the three methods that you can use to really get a good understanding of how well your model is performing. Um, for me personally, I rely heavily on the accuracy score. And then the questions, can I see them in the Q&A? Or is it the chat? Uh, these ones I'm looking at are in the Q&A. The chat okay. ones are a lot about um, kind of where the slack is and things like that. Okay. Consider, let's say the model is determined to be, okay. Okay, so let's say the model is determined to be poor, how do I improve? Well, there are a lot of different levers that you can pull or turn to improve your data, uh, to, to improve your model. The first issue could be related to data. Um, your data set could be imbalanced or, you know, you may not have enough of positive records um, or enough of negative records. So there are different ways that you can handle that. You can either go back and try to get more um, data sets or you can go through a process of balancing out your data. And that's something that I did not do as a part of this, but you can balance out your data and then run the training again. And so with machine learning and with just the training process, it does require a lot of experimentation. And so you may need to change some of the hyperparameters. Um, we didn't look at that today, but I think it was the last week when we pulled up the AWS console and we looked at, um, or maybe the week before, one of those videos, you'll see it, <laughs> where we pulled up the AWS console and I talked to you, I walked you through the hyperparameters. And so sometimes you'll have to tweak those hyperparameters and run the training job again um, and hope for, look for a, a better outcome. And so I think the big takeaway from, from that is with machine learning, there it requires a lot of experimentation um, to actually end up with something that is well performing and usable and that you can trust to put in a machine learning environment. Absolutely. I mean, that's the frustration and the fun of it, right? <laughs> that's the part that, that runs up your AWS bills, all that experimentation. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, yeah, there's another question about how much data. So what would you consider to be the quote unquote minimum amount of data points needed for a good model? Ooh. I think, right? Say that again? I think that varies depending on what you're working with. Yeah, it, it does vary. Um, I would say thousands and thousands and thousands <laughs> for as far as data. So for example, like the example that we looked at last week, the data set with the patient records, I think we ended up, once I cleaned up the data and got rid of like no records that didn't have the particular um, features that I was looking for, I think we ended up with, I can't remember, like 200 or 300 um, observations. In real life, that's not enough. Um, it's enough for a proof of concept, but for the real deal, you need, I would say, thousands and thousands and thousands of observations. Yeah, that's my answer. Thousands and thousands. <laughs> yeah, someone added a note here that more data as a sample means more power for prediction to the population. So. Exactly. Yeah. And um, that's all the questions um, about the workshop that I see here in the Q&A. So I'm just going to uh, wrap up the Q&A, but if you go into the chat, the link for the Slack is there and you can join, ask more questions, help each other out with all of this kind of stuff. Oops. Um, you can register your interest for the hackathon here at womenwhocode.com slash Mission Predictable Hackathon with dashes in between. Um, this is a registration of interest in 
the next few days, we're going to be sending out an email with a bit more information about the hackathon, the deadlines, the problem statement, all of that sort of thing. Um, but you can register to begin here and then we'll go from there. Next up in data science track here at Women Who Code is uh, a series introduction to natural language processing and that's ongoing. You can find that on our events page and also uh, learn more about it in the Slack channel. And as we said, the live hackathon uh, will be 19th of August for um, Mission Predictable. You can also follow along and find out more information, uh, Twitter, Women Who Code Data, Facebook, Instagram. You can reach out to me or Sapphire at any time. I'm Naomi at womenwhocode.com. And we just wanna thank you all and wish you a very good day. So thank you so much for uh, leading us all here today, Kesha. My pleasure. I cannot wait to see what you come up with. So thanks everyone and we'll let you go. Have a good one. See you in the Slack. See you at the hackathon. Yep. I'll see you all in, in the Slack channels. <laughs>